So on today's lecture and the next lecture, I want to introduce NMR spectroscopy. And we're going to start by having two lectures on theory. And I'll call it theory light because it's, it's basic principles that are involved in understanding NMR spectroscopy as as a practicing organic chemist and really understanding the interrelationships that we get. And I suppose, again, not to pay short shrift to metals, uh, many of the principles are going to apply, particularly some of the principles of spin and spin-spin coupling that we're, we're talking about with metals and phosphines and, and so forth. All right, so let us, let us begin. So the basic theory behind NMR spectroscopy is really, really simple. It's that nuclei effectively have a spin, or at least many nuclei, certain nuclei, effectively have a nuclear spin, and this creates a magnetic dipole. So if I wanted to sketch this, from sort of a, a cartoony point of view, if you envision this as a spinning nucleus, you get a magnetic dipole as a result of that. Now, if we imagine applying an external magnetic field, and we'll call that B naught. That's going to get the nuclear spins to align. So they're either going to align with or against the applied magnetic field. So you'll have a lower state where the spin is aligned with a lower energy state. So that's going to be lower in energy and we'll call that the alpha state. Or you can have the spin aligned against the applied magnetic field and we'll call that energy the beta state. And so this is sort of going to, to give us the starting point for thinking about NMR spectroscopy, this basic principle. Not all nuclei have a nuclear spin. In some cases, we will have more than two states, but not for the common nuclei that we're gonna study, not for proton or carbon-13 or for fluorine 19 or phosphorus 31. And yet some nuclei like carbon 12 have no nuclear spin. Oxygen 18 has no net nuclear spin. And some, although they have nuclear spin, effectively don't due to very quick relaxation between states. So for example, we've been talking in mass spec about chlorine 35 and chlorine 37. They do have a nuclear spin, but because of rapid interconversion between uh, relaxation among quadrupolar states, you can just ignore it. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about which nuclei have spin and how we can tell which are which. So 
So one way is just to, to keep things in mind because there aren't that many nuclei, there aren't that many atoms that organic chemists typically fuss about. So we can just go ahead and talk about typical nuclei studied by NMR. Um, and, you know, these would commonly be hydrogen C13, F19, uh, P31. And I'm going to go ahead and write in the mass numbers here. So C13, F19, P31, H1. And in fact, all of these nuclei can often be done with a single NMR spectrometer and a single probe or you know, not even a tunable probe, like I think the 400 right now in my building uh, where James is going to be collecting FIDs for, for the course, I think it's set up for all of these. So I'm also going to write in the mass number on these isotopes, and that's going to become important in a second. So hydrogen is one, carbon is six, fluorine is nine, and phosphorus is 15. Now, what is common to all of these is all of them have an odd mass number. And a general rule is that odd mass numbers, nuclei nuclei with odd mass numbers have a spin number that can be a half or three halves or five halves, etc. And we call the spin number I. And some of the nuclei have one half. All of the ones here have a spin number of one half. But some with an odd not mass number have three halves or five halves or even, even seven halves, I'll say, et cetera. And this is the simplest case, because this is what we call a nuclear dipole. These are what we call a nuclear quadrupole. And this is, this is important because if you have a nuclear dipole, then you can have spin states of, so if you have I equals one, you can have spin states of plus or minus one half. Now, all of this, if you're trying to, to deal with this or trying to assimilate this, isn't that big a deal other than to say, you can think of this as simply up or down. If on the other hand, you had I equals three halves, then you could have spin states. You could have four different spin states, plus or minus uh, three halves or plus or minus one half. Thoughts or questions at this point?
Let's take a look at some other nuclei with odd mass numbers. So one that's very important in biomolecular NMR is nitrogen 15. So nitrogen has an atomic number of seven. Most of the nitrogen that you encounter is N14, but we have a small amount of N15. The N15 is only 0.83% natural abundance. And the N15 has a spin number of a half, I equals one half. And it is indeed often studied. But because the natural abundance is very low, because it's only 0.838%, remember carbon, C13 NMR, is 1.1% and already is a harder technique than, than proton NMR. It requires more sample. Uh, nitrogen 15 NMR is very hard and natural abundance, but it's very useful in biomolecular NMR because of course you have amide bonds and proteins and it's easy to put in isotopic labels through protein expression. Oops. Now with that said, at the very end part of the course, maybe in week eight or week nine, probably week 10, I'll give you a reading on some natural product chemistry that is, is done with N15 NMR at natural abundance, but in general, that really pushes the limits. So in general, if you're going to be doing biomolecular NMR, you would just put N15 into your protein expression medium and generate an N15 labeled protein, and it's very easy. So another nucleus with an odd mass number is oxygen 17. Now you'll remember oxygen 17 when we talked about it in mass spec. It's only got a low abundance, very low abundance. It's 0.04%, but more importantly, O8, O17 has a spin number of five halves, and that gives rise to having a nuclear quadrupole. And basically, as a result, you have rapid relaxation, meaning you flip between spin states very rapidly, and you cannot, due to the uncertainty principle, cannot get a good sharp line. And as a result, it's not generally studied. Thoughts or questions at this point? All right, so that's, that's sort of the wrap for nuclei with an odd mass number. Now, the next 
category I want to look at is super easy. It's nuclei like carbon-12, oxygen-16, etc. In other words, nuclei with an even mass number and even atomic number So these, these are easy because nuclei with an even mass number and an even atomic number have no nuclear spin. In other words, I equals zero and they are NMR inactive. You can't take an NMR spectrum of them. They don't split anything else. Last category. So we have nuclei like deuterium, N14, etc. In other words, where you have an even mass number and an odd atomic number. All of these also have a nuclear quadrupole. So for example, you can have, some of them will have I equals one, a spin number of I equals one, or two, or three, etc., depending on the nuclei. So for example, deuterium has a spin number of I equals one, And it's one of the few quadrupolar nuclei that are actually reasonably easy to study. You have spin states of negative one, zero, and one. In other words, instead of having just spin up, or spin down, you effectively have spin up, no, no net spin, or spin down, three spin states. And most of you have already seen a manifestation of this phenomenon. Does anyone know what you've already seen, likely with your own eyes, that is a manifestation of deuterium having a spin number of one. Is it something to do with chloroform peak? Yeah, something to do with the chloroform peak. Do you know what it is? No, I never know it. look too carefully, so I'm not sure. Anyone else? You're right on right on track here. Are you just saying that it's not visible in the NMR? Well, it isn't. So it isn't visible in the H1 NMR. So we commonly use deuterochloroform as an NMR solvent. Modern NMR spectroscopy has the magnet lock on deuterium, which is very far from proton. It's down at, I 
think I think the number is on the order of 76 megahertz on a 500 megahertz NMR spectrometer. So deuterium is a mile away from a proton. It's just used as a tool. Your deuterochloroform, of course, contains some C13. It's 98.9% C12, but it's 1.1% C13. And that means when you take a C13 NMR in deuterochloroform at 77 ppm, you see a line associated with the chloroform or more specifically three lines. So here you are at 77 ppm. And those three lines correspond to the deuterochloroform peak. So this is your C13 DCL3 and your deuterochloroform is split into three lines because the deuterium can have spin up, spin zero, or spin negative one. So it is a one to one to one triplet. And I'm gonna give you one more piece of information that's going to come, come back and be useful later. And that is that the separation of these two, of any two lines, so the line to line distance for two lines is 32 hertz. And just stick a pin in that number for now, because we're going to come back to it when we talk about magnetogyric ratios. Thoughts or questions at this point? In your homework, we're gonna play a little further with this concept and you're going to be, be thinking about spectra like CD, CD2 Cl2, deuteromethylene chloride, and its implications. Um, in a moment, we're also going to come back to what happens in the proton NMR. And you're going to see yet another implication because the chemical purity of, proteo of deuterochloroform is about 99.8 or 99.9% deuterium with the remainder being protons. And we'll see the implications of that. This, of course, is not the natural abundance of chloroform. This is isotopically enriched. The deuterium is separated, deuterium is separated from bulk protons, from bulk water, and then used to prepare deuterochloroform. One of the other nice things about deuterochloroform is there isn't very, because there's just one deuterium per molecule and there's plenty of chlorine and carbon there, deuterochloroform is pretty cheap because deuterium is expensive to prepare to isolate and you don't need that much deuterium to make deuterochloroform, whereas say um, deuterated water has more deuterium in it. Okay, so let's take another look at implications or non-implications of nuclear quadrupoles.
So let's imagine this compound, tert-butyl acetamide. So tert-butyl acetamide is predominantly, mainly, uh, to the extent of 99.62% N14, which we said has a nuclear quadrupole. In other words, in this case, we have a spin state of I equals one, like deuterium, meaning you have spin up, spin zero, or spin down. Yet, how does this proton, for anyone who's done proton NMR or feels reasonably confident, how does this proton look in the NMR? How would you describe the multiplicity of the peak for the amide proton of tert-butyl acetamide? It's a broad peak. What's that? It's a broad peak. Like you see the peak or it's not as sharp. It can be a little bit, tiny bit broad. But often, particular, and often that's due to hydrogen bonding, it may be just a hair broader. But is it a singlet or something else? Uh, it should be a singlet, right? It is a singlet. And usually, when you have a nuclear quadrupole under most circumstances, you don't see spin-spin coupling. Deuterium is sort of a weird exception. Deuterium, I'll say, is, and of course, that's the same as H2. But in general, even though there are three spin states for this nitrogen, I equals our spin up, spin down, and spin zero, even though there are spin state, three spin states, you don't see coupling due to rapid relaxation of the nuclear quadrupole. In other words, because the spin is flipping from up and zero to zero to down very rapidly by the uncertainty principle, this proton doesn't end up seeing its neighbor long enough to be able to reflect its spin. Deuterium is unusual in that it doesn't relax rapidly, but most nuclear quadrupoles relax rapidly. If you see a little bit of broadness, which you will even under cases where there isn't variable hydrogen bonding, it's about a Hertz extra broadness. So very, very small, not, not fat like a carboxylic acid, which we'll talk about later, which does involve hydrogen bonding and going between hydrogen bonded states and other sorts of exchange. If you do see broadness, Generally, that would be due to sort of being, being on a kind of low millisecond time scale of relaxation. But we can describe it as a singlet. And of course, I'll point out, I just said that chlorine is a nuclear quadrupole. And yet in chloroform, where you have three chlorines attached to the same carbon that your hydrogen is on, you don't see spin-spin coupling to the chlorine. So in general, 
with the exception of deuterium, in general, you can ignore spin-spin coupling with quadrupolar nuclei. Now there's one exception that I know of that is very, very cool. And that is in high symmetry cases, which for organic chemists invariably means a tetrahedron with four things the same on it. And so if you take ammonium chloride, We'll take ammonium chloride in, say, DMSO, where it dissolves. You will end up seeing the ammonium group as a very unusual triplet with a gigantic J. So it's a one to one to one triplet, just like our deuterochloroform is with a very big coupling constant, hundreds of Hertz. I don't remember the exact number, but it's about a hundred Hertz. And so you'll see a line and a line and a line. And so this is our H1 NMR. I should just specify since we're bouncing around. And usually it'd be a little downfield. And if you ever have ammonium chloride as a contaminant, you're gonna see it. It's a very cool thing. Now, I've talked before about reading spectra. And I've talked about reading our mass spectra and reading our IR spectra. And that theme is going to continue for NMR spectra. And the human brain is fantastically good at picking up patterns. And when you see three lines, very far apart. So at first you might just think, oh, I've got a singlet. And I've got a singlet and I've got a singlet. But you start to think about it. And years get going and you say, wait a second. They're all the same height and the separation between these two is the same as the separation between these two and the gears get going and you start to see a picture or a pattern and it's really cool and then you start to infer oh wait a second so i remember we had ordered a kilogram of a hard to get chemical from china and I wanted to check that they really didn't, you know, that it was really the right stuff. So we dissolved it up in NMR in Deutero uh, DMSO and took an NMR spectrum and it was beautiful. And, you know, nice, clean, gigantic peaks for the compound. It was HOAT, it's a peptide coupling reagent. Down in the baseline, just teeny tiny. I could see three little lines, not trivial. You know, you integrate them and it's 0.2%, but because we ran a nice clean concentrated spectrum, you could see it, it's like, oh cool. When they isolated this or did some sort of workup, they must have at some point had ammonia in there and gotten ammonium chloride in there. And that's cool. So this tetrahedral situation is one situation where relaxation doesn't occur rapidly with a quadrupolar nucleus. Later on, I think when we talk about heteronuclear NMR, I'll give you one handout for um, where I show boron, borohydride, BH4 minus, sodium borohydride or lithium borohydride, I forget which. And there we're going to see two multiplets, and one of them is going to be a one to one to one to one quintet, and what the other is, I think, a one to one to one to one to one to one, if I've said the right number, septet, seven lines from the two isotopes of boron. And I 
forgotten which has a spin number of three halves and which one has a spin number. I think actually one, it may be, no, one I think is a septet and one may be a, one is a quartet and I think the other is a septet. I forget the numbers, but I will show you later. But it's the wildest thing because you do have there are the two boron isotopes and you have the quadrupolar coupling. But coming back for all intents and purposes, other than these very special circumstances, we can ignore coupling to nuclear quadrupoles. But it really is very pretty when you see it. All right, thoughts or questions? Uh, so why exactly do we see the uh, coupling in NH4? Relaxation is related to motions. It's tied into motions. And in the case of a high symmetry compound, you don't get these couplings between the motions of the molecule and the relaxation. So relaxation is, if I remember correctly, technically a, where you flip spins, is technically a forbidden process spectroscopically. It is the motions that allow it to occur. Uh, but you basically, it goes back when a high symmetry situation, it goes back to being a forbidden process. Or it is, it is what it is, which is a forbidden process. And we're very lucky because most relaxation is occurring on the order of, you know, nanoseconds or uh, picoseconds, or in some cases, microseconds. If you remember fluorescence, if you've ever studied fluorescence, fluorescence involves relaxation with emission of a photon. If you've ever studied fluorescence, fluorescence lifetimes are on the order of nanoseconds. Now, in the case of NMR spectroscopy, that's an issue because if relaxation does not occur on the order of, milli, on, really on the order of seconds or at least hundreds of milliseconds, you're not able to detect the energy differences involved. And that's what we're gonna come to next is getting down to the nitty gritty of the energy differences involved. Because when you're dealing with fluorescence or you're dealing with IR or you're dealing with UV vis or, you know, the energy differences are very large. In the case of NMR, they're very, very small. And this, this is going to be the really damning thing about NMR spectroscopy and why it was a technique that was developed well after UV vis and IR spectroscopy. So let's come a little bit at the baby level to some of the physics involved. So I said before that you've got an alpha state and a beta state for spinning nuclei in a magnetic field. And I mentioned that the alpha state is lower in energy than the beta state, where here is your applied magnetic field. So well, I'll say, all right, here is our applied magnetic field, B naught. Here's the alpha state. Here's the beta state aligned again, uh, with and against. And so you have an energy difference delta E, right? This is your delta E, your energy difference. And delta E, by definition, is equal to H nu. Planck's constant times nu, the energy of a photon to go between these states. 
In this case, our photon is going to be radio frequency. It's going to be, you know, 500 megahertz or 300 megahertz or whatever uh, for, the, for the frequency. And this is Planck's current state. And this energy gap that determines nu is dictated by the magnetogyric ratio gamma, the strength of the applied magnetic field. So gamma is the magnetogyric ratio, a property of the nucleus. That's essentially meaning how big the nuclear dipole is. I'll put that in parentheses, how big the nuclear dipole is. And B naught, and then divided by two pi. Okay, so the first thing that's important is if you put all of this together, delta E equals H times gamma times B naught divided by two pi, you see that the higher the B naught, the bigger the energy difference. Given that I've just said this technique, NMR spectroscopy, involves very, very small energy differences that are hard to measure, a bigger energy difference is generally better. And that means that that big superconducting magnet, the bigger, the better in general. In other words, if you have a 70,500 Gauss magnet, that's going to give rise to a 300 megahertz NMR. If you have rise to a 117,500 Gauss magnet, That's going to give rise to a 500 megahertz NMR. And it's all proportional. So if you're up to 188,000 Gauss magnet, that's an 800 megahertz NMR. And NMR spectrometers push the limits of how strong a mag how strong a homogeneous magnetic field you can make and the magnetic field has to be homogeneous so that the sample in the top of your nmr2 experiences the same magnetic field as the sample in the bottom and your energy differences are the same on the top and the bottom. If you had a non-homogeneous magnetic field and your spins were flipping at 299 megahertz at the bottom of the NMR tube, at 300 in the middle and at 301 in the top and a continuous gradient across, you wouldn't get a peak, you'd get a broad, broad band that would be too, too bad to see. So you're pushing the limits. And right now, the biggest NMR spectrometers that are sort of commercial are on the order of maybe a gigahertz with 1.1 and 1.2 pushing the bleeding edge limits and being you know, $10 million instruments that are very specialized. But for a typical department, having a 500 or 600 or 700 megahertz NMR 
is sort of normal routine instrumentation that costs, you know, some hundreds of thousands or perhaps a million dollars and is reasonably accessible. <coughs> All right, let me put these energy differences into context. So in UV spectroscopy, let's say I take a typical line like the mercury line at 254 nanometers. So that's well into the UV, right? The visible spectrum starts depending on how you're counting somewhere around 400 nanometers, give or take a little bit. Uh, this is in the UV. And if you go ahead and plug and chug into delta E equals H nu, and you, of course you convert wavelength to, uh, to frequency because, right, I'm giving you wavelength here and wavelength times, times frequency uh, goes together. So this is going to give rise to a delta E of 113 kilocalories per mole. And let's just think about what that means. That's on the order of a bond strength, right? That's the energy of making and breaking bonds, which kind of makes sense because if you think about it, if you're doing, say, an electronic excitation of a pi bond, you're exciting an electron from a bonding orbital to a non-bonding or an anti-bonding orbital, you're effectively breaking a pi bond by doing an excitation. So it makes sense that your energy for UV is on the order of 100 kilocalories per mole. IR is a much lower energy technique. We talked before about the term wave numbers. So for a carbonyl, 1700 wave numbers, reciprocal of wavelength, leads to a delta E of 4.87 kilocalories per mole. And again, that kind of makes sense. If you're exciting between vibrational states, to kick, in a, to kick up to a higher vibrational state is way less than the energy to kick from bonded to non-bonded, but it's you know, a fraction thereof. For NMR, now if we have a 500 megahertz NMR, that's leading to a delta E of 0. 0477, not kilocalories per mole, but small calories per mole. In other words, three orders of magnitude less than a kilocalorie per mole. So it's 0. 0.00000477 000 kilocalories per mole. Very small difference in energy. All right. I want to just finish up and come back to magnetogyric ratio. And I've already damned NMR spectroscopy on the grounds of energy. Next time I'm going to damn NMR spectroscopy on the grounds of Boltzmann distribution. But I just want to do one more, one last thing, which is come back to that magnetogyric ratio gamma and show us the implications. So I said gamma is the magnetogyric ratio and for a proton that number is 26753 and so with 117,000 gauss magnet Hundred and seventeen thousand five hundred Gauss magnet. That's five hundred megahertz. Now, one of the things that people often make a mistake on is they say, "Oh, I took that carbon NMR at five hundred megahertz." Well, guaranteed you didn't, unless you have a two gigahertz NMR spectrometer, and no one has a two gigahertz NMR spectrometer. 
because carbon is what we call a low gamma nucleus. Its magnetogyric ratio is roughly a quarter of that of a proton. So on that same 500 megahertz NMR spectrometer with that same 117,500 Gauss magnet, your carbon has an energy gap of 125.74 uh, megahertz. So you're taking 125 or 126 megahertz NMR. Fluorine is another high gamma nucleus. It's 25,179. I guess I'm not putting in commas here which means you're close to 500 megahertz, you're off at 470 megahertz, still a different, a completely different window in your electromagnetic spectrum, but not quite as far away. Phosphorus 31 is not that high a magnetogyric ratio, it's 10,840 and you're, you would be at 202.59 megahertz. And deuterium, which as I mentioned, is your lock frequency, is, gonna, is also low gamma. It's at 4,107, and that's going to be 76.76 .76 megahertz. All right, I want to come back to one last concrete thing that you've seen that's an implication of the magnetogyric ratio of proton and the magne of, a of a deuterium and the magnetogyric ratio of a proton. And so I'm going to come back to our deuterochloroform and we'll do a little bit of mental gymnastics and that will be, that will be our, our day for today. All right, so I already said that in our CDCL3 spectrum, in our C13 NMR, you see the deuterochloroform peak is a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one triplet and that J, which is a J1 CD, is equal to 32 hertz. Now, in deuterochloroform, as I mentioned before, I'm gonna, I'm gonna write this the same way just because it's confusing. Of course, you have about one, about 0.1% CHCl3. And so in your H1 NMR, when you go ahead and you take an H1 NMR spectrum, so this is 77 ppm, in your H1 NMR spectrum, You see your CD, your CHCl3 peak at 7.26 ppm, but around it, you see two C13 satellites from your C13 HCl3 content. Those satellites are each 0.55% the height of your deuterochloroform peak because you have 1.1% C13 and it's split. And the separation of those satellites is 209 hertz. And the reason it's two, so to put it another way, our J 
one CH equals 209. And it's not an accident that the 209 is bigger, 6.5 times as big as 32, because the magnetogyric ratio is 6.5 times bigger. In other words, 209 divided by 302 is the same as 26753 divided by 4107. In other words, it's 6.5. The ratio of gamma H to gamma D. James. Yeah. Isn't 4107 the magnetogyric ratio of deuterium? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I see now. Right. Yeah. Right. So we've got a little mental gymnastics going on here. In your carbon NMR, the C13 in deuterochloroform is being split by the 99%. The, the only thing you're seeing is the 1.1% C13, which is being split by the 99.9% .9 deuterium. In the proton NMR, you don't see anything from the deuterium. You're seeing the 1.1%, uh, the 0.1% of proton containing chloroform in the deuterochloroform. And then of that 0.1% proton containing chloroform in the deuterochloroform, 1.1% of it contains C13, which splits that, those molecules, those isotopologs into a doublet where each peak is now half of 1.1%. Percent, so it's 0.55 percent in height. So that's all the mental gymnastics we're going to do for today. And I know many of you have another class to run to. If anyone wants to stick around after class today, I'll be happy to answer questions. Otherwise, I will let you go or take those questions at the start of discussion today. Uh, hey, James. So I do have a question on the, the meaning of the megahertz again. I can't really, I guess, like conceptualize what it means. It is the frequency of the electromagnetic radiation. So okay. visible light is, I don't know how many zeros, how many gigahertz. Well, it's well behind, beyond gigahertz, uh, but it is basically, I don't know, 10 to the 15th, I'm sure I'm botching the number. And IR spectroscopy is down three orders of magnitude lower in, actually, no, it's not three orders, but it's a couple of orders of magnitude lower in frequency. And way at the other end of the electromagnetic spectrum, instead of UV, visible, infrared, microwave, we get to radio waves. And so on that electromagnetic spectrum, we are now down in the lower end, the radio wave end of the spectrum. And that's our frequency of the photon, just as you have a photon emitted or absorbed in UV spectroscopy. That's the frequency of the photon absorbed in NMR spectroscopy. Oh, and then we're 
so, so essentially we're measuring the frequency of the or sorry we're we're measuring radio waves in NMR then yeah exactly okay. and it's effectively radio waves um well depending on how you're doing it's either absorbed or emitted in practice in practice, it gets to be a little more complicated because we're actually measuring precession rather than the absorption of the photon itself. We're measuring another phenomenon, which is the precession of the magnetic vector, but it is effectively the energy that's been absorbed. Okay, uh, and then one last thing before we go. So, like the the so does that mean that like a higher megahertz will be easier to detect? In general, yes. I mean, put, put simply, your body has great detectors for visible, for visible light. There are two of them in your face. And in doing that, you're exciting an electronic transition in a molecule in your, um, in your eye, in a chromophore that's bound to a protein in your eye. And that's relatively easy. Um, you know, some animals can see into the UV, some I think can see a little bit into the IR, but to my knowledge, no organism has a sensory capability for radio waves.